Hallelujah and blessings in Jesus, friends. Welcome back to High Kadosh Ministries, where holiness is a way of life. Jesus is truly King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and the Holy Bible is our only standard and authority for truth. And together, God's people say with hearts of praise, Hallelujah. Well, friends, today is November the 3rd in the year of our Lord, 2017, and this is one a day for the soul. Now, we're continuing our review of the book of Hosea, and today we're going to begin chapter 2. Now, before we begin, let me point out again that this is somewhat of a parable. It is a true story through the life of Hosea, and yet God is using it to illustrate something much deeper the whoredom that Israel has played with the pagan nations around them. And we can apply that to ourselves as the people of God, because as we seek to serve the Lord, sometimes we allow ourselves to take on the ways of this world. And that is creating spiritual adultery within us before the Lord God, whom is represented through scripture as our husband. We are the wife, the bride of Christ. And so we must be very careful what we give ourselves to. And that's what this story illustrates. So let's pick up in Hosea chapter 2 and verse 1. Now you got to remember, and as I've pointed out, that the Bible was never written with chapters or verses. So the letter that we're reading today from Hosea is one long story. So in order to move into chapter 2, let's finish with the last few verses of chapter 1. God says in verse 10, The number of the children of Israel shall be of the sand of the sea. It cannot be measured nor numbered. It shall come to pass that in the place where it was said unto them, You are not my people, there it shall be said unto them, You are the sons of the living God. And so God says, I am going to cut you off as my people because you continue to commit this whoredom with the other nations around you. You continue to give yourselves unto things that are important to them, their rituals, their customs, their ways of worship, and you're not committed unto me. So at the end of verse 10, he also ends with a promise. Just as you have left me and I have forsaken you because of it, there's a day coming in the future where we will be reconciled and it'll take place in the very place where you are being cut off. Then shall the children of Judah and the children of Israel be gathered together and appoint themselves one head. So they'll no longer have separate kings, but they'll all have one king, one leader, one ruler. And that will be a great day in the land of Jezreel. So because of this, say unto your brethren, Ami, which means God's somebody. Now remember, in verse 9 of chapter 1, lo ami means nobody. But God says ami means God's somebody. And so now God is saying, because I have cut you off, you are nobody in the land. But when this day comes that we will be reconciled, you will become somebody again. So say unto your brethren, ami, or somebody, and to your sisters, Rahama, which means all mercy. Now, God is cutting off his mercy for a time, but there's coming a day that they will return to the Lord their God, and because of that, he will show mercy unto them. Now, keeping in mind as we read this, this is a parable. It's an illustration of a deeper truth, and there's no break here. God continues by saying, plead with your mother, plead, for she is not my wife neither am I her husband. That relationship has been broken because of her evil practices. Let her therefore put away her whoredoms out of her sight and her adulteries from between her breasts. And so just as God is saying this and illustrating this about Israel, this is a true statement about Gomer, Hosea's wife. She has given herself to other men and because of this, judgment will come upon her as well. God continues in verse 3, and he says, Lest I strip her naked, I set her as in the day that she was born. So God is saying this to Hosea about Gomer, but he's also saying this to Hosea about the people of Israel. And the reason that he's doing this in Hosea's life on a real issue with Gomer is because he wants Hosea to feel the pain 
that comes from loving someone so deeply and yet being betrayed in such a horrible fashion. And so as Hosea experiences these emotions of pain and heartache because of the way that his wife is treating him, he can get a small glimpse of the broken heart that God has over his people. And friends, that should stop us in our tracks because when we betray the Lord, if we've ever been betrayed and we know how that affects us, how do we think it affects the Lord? And that's what's being pointed out here. So he says, I'll strip her naked. I'll set her as in the day that she was born. I'll make her as a wilderness, like dry land, and I'll slay her with thirst. I will not have mercy upon her children, for they be the children of whoredoms. Now there's much debate about this particular verse because Many want to fall back to chapter one and say that these three children that were born to Hosea weren't actually from his seed, that they came from the men that Gomer was sleeping with outside of her marital relationship. Yet there's really nothing to signify that in the story. So it's left to speculation. And so it could be that God is using this particular passage, this one verse, as truly being a parable and not really reflecting the life of Gomer. But in the story of the lesson, in the moral that we are to take from it, it really doesn't matter. The fact is, once we've given ourselves unto someone, we're to be faithful in that commitment. And Israel has not been faithful in its commitment to the Most High. Neither has Gomer been faithful to her commitment to Hosea. It continues in verse 5, says, Their mother played the harlot. She that conceived them hath done shamefully. For she said, I will go after my lovers, the ones who take care of me, who give me bread and water, wool and flax, oil and drink. But God says, Therefore, behold, I will hedge up thy way with thorns. I'll make a wall that she shall not find her paths. She will be like a sheep that has gone astray, to borrow words from Jesus. She shall follow after her lovers. But she will not overtake them. She shall seek them, but not find them. Then she will say, I'll go and return to my first husband. For then it was better with me than now. Now I know as we read this story, our mind wants to be centered on one or the other. So as we read, we want to think about Hosea or Gomer, or we want to think about Israel and God, but we have to be mindful of both. Yet there's a third position we must take, and that is in our own experience with the Lord. And so too have many of us been like the prodigal son. We've spent our inheritance on foolish things on the ways of this world, in the ways of this world. And yet when we realize that there was no fulfillment, that they brought no satisfaction to us, we said we will go back to the father as a servant. We're not interested in returning as a son. We will simply go back as a servant for it was better for us there than it is for us now. We've lost our peace. We've lost our joy. And that's what God is saying here about Gomer and Israel and about us. He continues in verse 8 and says, She did not know that I was the one that was giving her corn, wine, oil. I was the one that was multiplying her silver and gold, which they had prepared for Baal. It wasn't her lovers that were taking care of her. It wasn't the pagan nations that were taking care of Israel. And it wasn't our own efforts our own due reward because of the things that we have done that we provide for ourselves all the time. It was the hand of God in our lives, in their lives, in her life. And so God continues in verse nine says, therefore will I return. I'll take away my corn in the time thereof, my wine in the season thereof. I'll recover my wool, my flax given to cover her nakedness. So in other words, he's saying, I'll take everything from her so that she has nowhere else to look but up. She has to look to my hand as provider. And so he says this of us, and so he says this of the people of Israel. He continues, now will I discover her lewdness in the sight of her lovers. I'll reveal her nakedness, in other words, and none shall deliver her out of my hand. I will cause all her mirth to cease, her feast days, her new moons, her Sabbath, all her solemn feasts. I will destroy her vines, her fig trees, whereof she has said, these are my rewards that my lovers have given me, and I will make them a forest, and the beasts of the field shall eat them. So against her own attempts to make her life so satisfying, so fulfilling, I will strip her life bare and bring her to a state of destitution. 
I will visit upon her the days of Balaam, where is she burned incense to them. She decked herself with her earrings, her jewels. She went after her lovers, and she forget me, saith the Lord. And you forget me, saith the Lord. And my people Israel have forgotten me, saith the Lord. Therefore, I will allure her. I will woo her back into the wilderness and speak comfortably unto her. I will give her vineyards from thence in the valley of Achor for a door of hope. She shall sing there as in the days of her youth, as in the day when she come up out of the land of Egypt. God is saying, I will pursue her. I will pursue you, friend. I will pursue my people Israel, and I will bring them back into a place of joy and happiness. But before that day comes... They will suffer much because of the choices that they have made. And it shall be at that day, saith the Lord, that thou shalt call me Ishi, and shall call me no more Bali. Now, Ishi simply means husband, and Bali is another way of saying Baal. So the Almighty is saying, they will call me husband. They will honor me. They will revere me. They'll be true to me, and they shall no more call me Baal. And so as we see in the story of the golden calf, it isn't necessarily that the people of Israel were always worshiping a pagan God, but they were worshiping God through a medium. And it is that medium, whether it's a statue, an idol, it's that medium that the Almighty finds as an abomination because he says, I want your true worship. Don't make an image and worship me through that image. He continues in verse 17, I'll take away the names of Balaam out of their mouth. And look what he says in verse 19. He says, I will betroth thee. I will engage thee. I will renew a passionate relationship with thee unto me forever. Yea, I will betroth thee unto me in righteousness, in judgment, in loving kindness, and in mercies. I will even betroth thee unto me in faithfulness, and thou shalt know the Lord. In verse 23, he says, I will sow her unto me in the earth, and I will have mercy upon her that had not obtained mercy. And I will say to them, which were not my people, thou art my people, and they shall say, thou art my God. And so the lesson that we can take from this, friends, is if God has placed his hand of choice upon us, we can run to the ends of the earth. But we're only bringing upon ourselves misery, pain, suffering, heartache, because it is these things that the Lord will bring upon us to bring us back to a fellowship and a relationship with him. And so he will release us to go our own way, but he'll never forget us. He'll never be far behind as he pursues us in that loving relationship that he so desires. Now, if you're in fellowship with God today, you can look back on your life and you can see how this was true for you. If you're watching this video and you are wayward, you have drifted from the Lord, you have ventured back out into the ways of this world, you need be warned, friend, because you're only inviting misery into your life. Because if God cannot get your attention through his goodness, his forbearance, and his mercy, then he'll allow you to reap what you've sown And that could be a hospital bed, that could be a prison sentence, that could be a disease or an illness, but he will bring you to a place where you only are left to look up, to reach out and take his hand in repentance and confession and receiving forgiveness for the choices that you so willingly and foolishly made. And so let us leave our time together, friends, being both warned and encouraged. Let us be warned in departing from the Lord because the consequences are harsh and severe. And let us be encouraged as we return unto the Lord, only blessings, his blessings are the things that we will experience. For as a loving and caring husband cares for his wife, protects his wife, helps his wife, so too will he do and does he do for us, friends. Well, I'm so grateful you're again with us this morning. I pray that you have been challenged in your walk with the Lord. I pray that you've received encouragement, and I pray that your day will be full of joy and blessing. Now, as he wills, and until tomorrow, friends, I love you, and I'll see you on the next video.